ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, Jeff Dunn's my name, and it's my privilege to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. And on behalf of the PCFA and ICON, Cancer Care, we do welcome you uh, to this webinar this afternoon uh, on focal brachiotherapy. Uh, to help me this afternoon, we have a, a star-spangled a, a star -spangled panel of experts. Uh, we certainly have Dr. Andrew C. Uh, and Andrew is a radiation oncologist um, at ICON Cancer Centre. Um, uh, and of course, we also have uh, uh, Associate Professor Jeremy Grummet. And Jeremy is a urologist, also uh, based in Melbourne. And in addition to that, we have PCFA's very own Director of Nursing, uh, Sally Sara, uh, who's also on the panel today to help us as we navigate issues surrounding focal bracket therapy and, and this new treatment, relatively new treatment for people diagnosed uh, and treated for prostate cancer. We have about 70 uh, people registered for the webinar. So to each and every one of you, thank you. It's terrific to have you here, um, wherever you are throughout Australia. And of course, to those of you who may be joining us from overseas, uh, everyone is welcome. And we do encourage you to participate. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen as we go through, there's a Q&A button down below. So if you do have any questions you'd like to submit to our panelists throughout the session, uh, please do type them in. Uh, and we'll take note of those and time permitting at the end, uh, depending how we travel today, we'll certainly address those. And if not, uh, we might ask our panelists anyway to, to actually record or, or, or note a response to those which we can add to the um, presentation which we place uh, on websites uh, and other places after the session today. So look, without, without further ado, why don't we kick it off? So, so first of all, you know, Andrew and Jeremy, can you, can you tell us you know, a bit about focal bracket therapy and, and, and what it actually is. And, and maybe Jeremy, can you kick us off? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and thanks PCFA and ICON for, for putting this on today. Uh, we really appreciate your involvement uh, and your ability to hopefully spread the message to anyone who's interested. So in terms of trying to explain focal brachy therapy, I thought what I might do to start off with is just show you a couple of really simple slides so that you, so that people who are listening can actually picture what we're talking about. I think sometimes it's a bit hard to understand when uh, you, you're just talking. So I'll just share my screen really um, briefly here. Just bear with me while I get this up. All right. So um, hopefully you can see uh, my screen here and just going back to the first slide. So in terms of what it is, Focal brachytherapy is really quite simple. It's brachytherapy, which is the implantation of radioactive seeds into the prostate. But instead of putting them all through the prostate, we simply put them into the tumour and a very narrow margin surrounding the tumour uh, as a safety margin. And that really is essentially what it is. Now, for the, from the patient's perspective, if any listeners out there, for example, have... Uh, experienced, for example, a transperineal biopsy or, or know what it involves, um, you can see a picture. I hope you can see this here on the screen. In fact, I might just try and make that full screen. Here we are. So if you can see my cursor on the right there uh, going over this picture, you can see a probe. This is entering the rectum. And there are these tiny little needles uh, implanting these uh, like grains of rice type seeds into the prostate. But as you can see over on the left here, they're only putting it into the tumour, not the entire area of the prostate. Now, if you've had a biopsy, you know that this is almost identical. So what we're doing with bra focal brachytherapy is almost like a, a transperineal biopsy in reverse. Instead of taking tiny samples of tissue out, we're implanting tiny seeds in uh, to the prostate. So it's it really is a, a minor procedure. I think, as I said, Jeff, the, probably the best way is just to quickly take you through what a, what a classic example case looks like. And, and we'll come back to who is the right person for this, but hopefully this will provide sort of an example. But in terms of who the right person is to get this treatment, that's really critical. And, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about that in a moment. But let's say, for example, this real patient, 65 years old, elevated PSA of 8.5. Okay, so normal PSA range is up to three. And this 
is the MRI that we obtained uh, for this patient. So you can see, I hope if I can just get my cursor going, there's kind of a, this whole area here is the prostate in cross section. And this is a, there's a darker area at the front, which corresponds to this darker area here, which corresponds to this lighter area here. This is all the same patient's MRI, just viewed in different ways. When you put this together, it's highly suspicious of prostate cancer. So based on that, we went ahead and did a biopsy. And this is really just a, a 3D representation of what our transperineal biopsy looks like. The green represents the prostate gland. The lines going through it, all these kind of pink lines are where the biopsy needles have taken samples from. And then you can see this pink lump at the front of the prostate, which matches perfectly with the MRI we saw before. This is the lesion that's been mapped out in 3D. And you can see a whole bunch of pink lines going through it there, which represent samples from that lesion. So we, we always sample the, the tumor itself as well as the rest of the prostate to make sure there's nothing going on. Now we ended up doing that with this patient, that's his diagram. And this is the result. So we did find what we call significant prostate cancer. In this case, grade group two in the new grading system or Gleason three plus four equals seven in the older grading system. Now this is intermediate prostate cancer. And importantly, it was only found in this area. All these other samples were clear. There was nothing there. Now we then went on and performed focal brachytherapy. And of course, we'll talk more about the, the details of that. Uh, Andrew can go through in just a moment, but we mentioned that this man's focal, uh, sorry, his um, PSA before focal brachytherapy was 8.5. And we, as part of this registry that we're gonna discuss, we are very, um, we, we monitor patients extremely closely after the treatment to make sure that everything's going as expected. So you can see these PSA levels that he's had post-treatment at six months, 12 months, 18 months. So notice that they're much lower than the pre-treatment PSA, but they don't go to zero. And that's expected because there's still normal prostate tissue remaining producing a degree of PSA. Um, furthermore, the patient had an MRI, which we'll see in a minute, um, and a post-treatment biopsy, uh, which showed low-grade disease only and treatment effect. There was no remaining significant cancer in the biopsy. And we do exactly the same biopsy. We take a whole lot of target cores from the tumor and a whole lot of uh, random samples from the rest of the prostate. The main thing I guess I wanna get home to people listening about this particular example case is it really demonstrates exactly what we're trying to achieve with this new targeted treatment. I asked this guy, what side effects have you experienced from the treatment? And he said, what treatment? In other words, his the impact on this man from either treatment or post or post procedure or post therapy was so minimal that he made a joke of how little it had actually affected him. And then, and this was that post treatment MRI I was talking about. And you can see the yellow circle here with all these black dots in the middle. Each one of those black dots represents a brachytherapy seed. So you can see we've got this beautiful targeted treatment of his area with no remaining significant cancer. And I've put these yellow circles around these areas here because that's where the erectile nerves run, okay? As opposed to where the tumor is right at the front here. And so you, what you can see, I guess, demonstrated here is that the treatment has had no impact at all on his erectile function because the radiation is only being given to the tumor, not to the whole prostate. So I might just stop sharing my screen there for a moment so that perhaps we can discuss that further and, and perhaps Andrew might like to, to chime in on, on some of the technical aspects of that. Certainly. Um, thanks, um, uh, Jeremy and Jeff. Uh, you make a, a very convincing radiation oncologist, uh, Jeremy. Um, in terms of um, where I see focal brachytherapy, for us it's essentially been uh, somewhat of an evolutionary process and we've been doing whole gland brachytherapy for you know over two decades and um, in our in our group per se you know we've been responsible for over two and a half thousand uh, implants 
But this sort of takes things uh, to the, the next level. And as Jeremy has mentioned, um, essentially what it is, it's a personalised treatment plan, which is apportioned to the risk of the patient in that individual. So each uh, patient that we treat um, is managed in a, in a very uh, unique way, taking into account the specific characteristics um, of that particular cancer. So in other words, it's not a, a one size fits all. So as, as Jerry mentioned, the, 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 the technical aspects of focal brachytherapy is us assuming you know, all the diagnostic information that our urological colleagues have provided with the multi-parametric MRI and all the eloquent biopsies. And then we make this um, a very complex three-dimensional um, model of the prostate, specifically then applying the seeds within the cancer. And we've slightly modified our deployment technique and we've been working uh, with the uh, trade to, to slightly re-engineer the prosthetic. But what we can do is we can very tightly confine the radiation um, to the uh, cancer itself with a, a small safety margin. And thereby, the beauty of this is, you know, it's, it's gonna be no better at curing cancer, but the beauty will be um, that the doses to the surrounding healthy organs are, are going to be significantly less than what we see with whole gland brachytherapy. So you know, our anticipation will be that we see improved you know, um, quality of life outcomes across both bowel, urethral and sexual domains. Um, so, um, you know, it's sort of like not all uh, cancers need to be uh, treated with a bazooka. If you've got a very bad prostate cancer, and Jeremy will talk about what that looks like in a moment, yes, you do need to go a more traditional route but this is a very nice intermediate option for men with low, low intermediate risk cancer where you don't know whether perhaps you might want to provide them with active surveillance or they've just got some features that might warrant definitive treatment. And this is that sort of mid ground option and uh, something that's new and I think very exciting. If I might, um, Andrew and Jeremy, just a, a quick question at this point, because this is a, a something which has been put to us and will be of interest to those listening. Uh, in, in terms of the potential side effect profile, you know, and side effects are an issue for some men who get treated uh, with prostate cancer. Well, what can you expect? Because from the early discussion, it seems that side effects will be will be less uh, and different. So is that the case? So, Jeff, if, perhaps if I can start the answer and let Andrew finish. Um, uh, in the in the lead into this regis registry, uh, which Icon is running um, to gather all this prospective information, um, we have really piloted uh, this new therapy, uh, and so we've got an experience of over thirty patients now um, who have undergone this, and uh, our results to date would indicate that um, some patients do indeed uh, experience some side effects, but uh, in fact. The, the majority of them, uh, the side effects are really very mild. And uh, again, I'll, I'll defer to Andrew, but when you compare it to, for example, whole gland brachytherapy, which is an option, and certainly to radical prostatectomy, which I routinely perform also, uh, it's chalk and cheese. They're, they're, the side effects appear to be way lower Obviously, I was giving a, 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 an example before, which was particularly demonstrable of what we're trying to aim for, but that was a real patient. Um, but Andrew, yeah, I'd be interested to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, well, so far, the, you know, the international experience, which is consistent with our pilot data, um, suggests that your men do get a sense or degree of acute you know, urinary symptoms, which on the whole is, is, is certainly very mild, self-limiting and mostly fully resolved within um, two or, or three months. Mm. Uh, whereas with the other option, that's sort of the whole gland uh, approach, oftentimes men do have quite significant uh, urinary irritability symptoms for even up to 12 months um, or longer. So just looking at that um, domain, um, you know, it, it, it certainly has been proven across a number of centres that um, it wins out. The case that uh, Jeremy um, showed before with uh, the anterior lesion, I think you could quite uh, nicely see that there was in fact zero dose to both um, rectum and also to the neurovascular bundle. So we would expect in that particular um, individual that there'd be no 
uh, impacts with bowel function and hopefully uh, maintenance of um, erectile function and sexual health. Because uh, commonly with whole gland brachytherapy, we would always um, consent men that there could be a one to two percent chance that radiotherapy, you know, could cause some damage to the front wall of the rectum, mm. uh, and also depending on what their general health was like uh, and also their sexual function prior to treatment, there's there will be an impact with erectile dysfunction, not immediately, but over the sort of twelve to eighteen months after um, treatment. So I think. Uh, the early pilot data looks very promising, at least in terms of the um, uh, toxicity profile with this approach. And Jeff, that's really given us the impetus to go down this track and, and you know, put all the effort in to create this registry um, so that we can collect every little piece of relevant data um, going forward. Because I think that's one of the really critical comments I want to make today is that this all sounds very well and good. Um, and our experience to date is, but there's no point voicing that opinion or anecdotal sort of evidence without being able to back it up with hard prospective evidence. And that's, and that's why we're, we're running this registry. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, terrific. It's good to hear this. Can I just, just drop in with another question now in a sense? So um, is, is focal brachytherapy for everyone? Like where, where is it indicated and, and for which men might it not be appropriate? So, so maybe um, if that, that's probably a good opportunity, just for, perhaps if I can just share my screen briefly with you again. Um, yeah. This is really, um, I'll just get that off there. So oh, here you go. tell me if you can see that this is the inclusion criteria. And I, it's worth spelling this out because this is a critical point um, here uh, in, um, uh, for, for focal brachytherapy. So I'm just trying to move it up so it's a bit easier to see. That's better. Okay. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, the thing about focal therapy in general and focal brachytherapy is, is obviously one type of focal therapy is that it sits in the middle of two quite severe extremes. You've got, as Andrew mentioned, active surveillance on the one hand, where you're actually not treating at all. You're just observing closely and you may need treatment down the track. And then at the other extent, you've got some whole gland treatment, whether that's surgical uh, removal, radical prostatectomy, or whole gland brachytherapy, for example, or maybe external beam radiotherapy. So focal sits right in the middle of that, and therefore the eligibility criteria need to sit right in the middle of that. And as a result, um, these are what need to uh, be present. So PSA, in other words, can't be too high. Focal therapy of any sort should not be offered to patients with really aggressive disease. Um, and that relates also to the clinical stage. So you can see T1C or T2A. What that means is that either you can't feel it when you do a rectal examination, or you might be able to just feel it in one small area. Again, denoting, you know, this is, we're not talking about bulky um, aggressive disease. Um, you must be able to see the lesion on imaging. Now, mainly that's going to be um, under an MRI because that is the current standard of care uh, is to get an MRI before any biopsy, in fact, nowadays. Um, some uh, listeners may be interested to note that this is a guideline that only came in in March last year. A lot of us have been using MRI for a few years in Australia now, but it is now officially part of clinical guidelines based on uh, very high level evidence. So, and this makes perfect sense. This is, if you're going to treat focally, you've got to know with great uh, confidence where the tumour is within the prostate. So PIRAD scoring is just a way of uh, how we score uh, MRI and three to five just essentially means that it's positive. In other words, you can see a suspicious lesion. The biopsy has then got to match what the Im imaging shows. If there's discordance between the two, it's not a goal because there's too much uncertainty as to, as to what we're actually dealing with. And then in terms of the actual grade, so I'm just sticking with the Gleason system because probably most people are still familiar with that. It's really, another really important point is we do not want to be using focal therapy to replace active surveillance in men who do not need treatment at all, okay? So we, there there's, uh, has been in the past a real criticism of over-treatment, which has been entirely justified when it, when it has occurred. 
And we don't want to be replicating that just because we've got some other treatment that we want to use. We want to use it in exactly the appropriate patient. So if you've only got Gleason 6, which is the lowest grade you can get on a biopsy, then you'd better have a fair chunky volume of it. So in this case, we're talking about more than a centimeter in diameter to make it worthwhile to consider this as an option. But really the, the main target group here is Gleason 7, and it can either be three plus four or four plus three, as long as it's not too big. So if it's four plus three, it's gotta be less than a centimeter. Again, like I was saying earlier, we do not wanna be treating really aggressive cancers, and we certainly do not wanna be treating multifocal disease. This is for a single lesion within the prostate. Um, and it, it, look, it really is analogous. We can come back to this uh, down the track, but the idea is that you're just treating the tumor, not the whole prostate. And that's why you have so, so fewer side effects. Very, much, very similar to the whole concept of lumpectomy for localized breast cancer, rather than you know, um, deforming the body by doing a radical mastectomy as used to be standard, um, women are now receiving a standard of care, a lumpectomy in certain circumstances where the tumor is small enough. It's exactly the same principle. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but prostate cancer is a multifocal disease. Well, a lot of the time it is. And when that happens, focal therapy is not appropriate. However, what we're finding with imaging these days is that a lot of the time, actually, it's unifocal disease, especially if it's just significant cancer in one spot. And that's where focal therapy comes in. So follow up, um, in, as I said, is very strict. Uh, we keep a very close eye on all our patients in terms of PSA, clinical exam, uh, a full quality of life assessment by way of a, a questionnaire. Uh, and then, and this is a really important point, at 18 months after the treatment, everyone has to have an MRI and a follow-up biopsy. The reason for this, even if the PSA has come down nicely, as we saw in that last patient, is that we really, because this is a new treatment, we need to substantiate with hard evidence that we've done the right thing and the patient really has had their significant cancer eradicated. Andrew, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks, Jeremy. So, so certainly that's a very good synopsis of the sort of biologic factors, I suppose, of the target population that we're looking to um, treat and recruit. There are a couple of um, very sort of specific uh, inclusion or exclusion criterion that are you know, sort of very much you know, radiation specific and not necessarily necessarily urologic or oncologic in nature. Um, and I'm just sort of looking at some of the um, online questions, which um, is alluding to some of these very factors. And there's a question, um, I think, from um, uh, Simon Anderton, for example, who's asked, um, does size of the prostate um, matter uh, or make one, um, uh, could exclude someone from the treatment? The answer is potentially so. So the thing with whole gland brachytherapy is we are quite careful with who we accept on the program. And if you have a very large prostate, you know, something that could be in excess of um, 50 gram, 50 cc, up to 60 cc, then generally it's one very or more technically challenging to implant. You have to use a little bit more radiation. And I think men will generally have um, more inflammatory and urinary irritability symptoms after surgery. Whereas uh, with focal therapy, our, our sense is that um, these specific parameters perhaps can be um, relaxed a little bit, although we are still being extremely careful and applying due diligence. The sort of anecdotal and uh, evidence thus far suggests that even if you do have a slightly enlarged prostate, um, if you're just treating focally, a small volume of the gland. In fact, you actually probably can get through a treatment quite well with no extra morbidity. Another uh, thing that we also get um, quite concerned or a little bit curious about is if you've had a previous um, or prior TURP. And this may of course have been even some decades before the diagnosis of prostate cancer and overseen specifically because um, a man may have had obstructive symptoms from benign prostatic enlargement, not cancer. Well, then this is another group where it, it can be um, tricky to implant only because usually when you've had a, um, you know, a large TURP, 
quite a lot of the central core of the prostate has been removed and actually quite difficult to engraft the seeds into the cancer and only unless we're absolutely confident that we can do so, we'll, we'll accept someone onto uh, the program. So just in terms of the logistics of the treatment, four weeks before um, men have surgery, I'll do um, a transrectal ultrasound study under um, a, a very quick light sedation or general anaesthetic. And, and it's at that stage that I recreate um, a three-dimensional model of the prostate, looking specifically for all these geometric factors. And then I overlay all the diagnostic information from the biopsy and so forth. So we sort of you know, re recreate the, um, the crime scene uh, as such. Um, so look, there are two additional factors, uh, Jeremy. Hey, uh, Andrew, wh while you're talking there, th thank, thank you for that. Just to follow up, because you mentioned about a part of the process, how you know, you'll, you'll do some workup stuff a month before and you'll, you'll you know, visit the crime scene, as you've said. But what, tell us just a, a quick change. Who's involved, who, who's involved in delivering focal bracket therapy, but both you know, before, during and, and after the treatment? And what, what, can, what can fellows expect? So brachytherapy is, is very much a, a team sport um, and within our implant team, we've got a number of um, health um, professionals who will have their own particular role and responsibility throughout the implant um, process, which sometimes can require two or three encounters over two or three months. Um, I, I work uh, with uh, a craft group called um, radiation therapists, um, and these are uh, trained scientists, if you like, who by and large oversee uh, the delivery of um, uh, all aspects of radiation treatment delivery. The, the therapists that I work with have been and have undergone additional uh, training with um, interventional work. Um, these uh, 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 people assist me in, in designing the, 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 the treatment plan. So when you know, working out exactly how we should apply seeds uh, within the prostate and how many seeds we may need to order. Uh, they're also involved with doing uh, QA. Uh, so men who undergo um, this treatment will have a, another CT scan done usually on day 30, just to make sure that all the, all the seeds um, are residing within the precise location. Overarching um, the, the crew, we've got medical um, physicists or radiation oncologists or oncology medical physicists. They, these are a crafty group of very intelligent individuals who by and large live in the uh, the dungeons uh, of our radiation oncology department, but I drag them up to theatre once uh, every two or three weeks, give them a little bit of vitamin D uh, and then banish them back down into the dungeon. And of course, we've got our um, prostate um, cancer uh, nursing team and our clinical nursing team within radiation oncology and theatre. Um, but actually overseeing the implant, it's always uh, a, a, a urologist with a radiation oncologist. So it's a joint, a joint implant process. Excellent. Thanks, man. It's, uh, um, you're, you're dungeons and uh, scenes of crime a repetitive theme Andrew which is interesting for radiation oncology actually Andrew you just mentioned about the prostate cancer specialist nurses we've got Sally Saro with us who's the director of nursing for PCFA who oversees you know prostate cancer specialist nurses around the country uh, Sally have you got any observations about focal bracket therapy and and you know what role for the nurse and and interaction with patients because this is a relatively new treatment, emerging treatment, I suspect that our prostate cancer specialist nurses around Australia will start to get quite a few questions um, to them. And, and often when, when a man's diagnosed with prostate cancer and he's considering treatment options, um, we spend quite a lot of time um, with men in that setting because making a decision can be really, really difficult. And whilst as clinicians, we think that those, those men with all the options available to them are, are you know, quite fortunate in a way, but for the chap himself to make a decision is often the most difficult decision he's ever had to make. Um, so, and our response will be similar to men who are making any treatment decision really is about taking the time to learn about what the options are. Um, and and we, we're often, people will say to us, oh, you know, this option wasn't offered to me. Why wasn't I told? Why wasn't I told about this? Mm -hmm. um, the flip side is often that people haven't asked what are all of the treatment options available? Um, but I think in this setting, it's really important for men who are considering this to, to take the time to ask questions, to learn about it, and, and not to be scared off by a, a title of a treatment that, I mean, brachytherapy, you know, it sounds so scientific where it's, um, 
to, to actually learn about it and ask, ask um, questions like, you know, where, where will it be done? How much will it cost? Will I have to wait? What will the follow-up be afterwards? How do those side effects compare to other treatments?